In this final video on the diversity of life, we'll be talking about vertebrates. In the previous video, we talked about sponges, cnidarians, flatworms, and the protostomes. So the final groups of animals we'll be talking about are the deuterostomes. And of the deuterostomes, the first one we'll discuss are the echinoderms, phylum echinodermata. The prefix echino means spiny, and in this case derm refers to skin, so echinoderms are literally named for the spiny surfaces of these organisms. This is most exemplified in the sea urchin, but there are several other echinoderms as well, including sea cucumbers, sea stars, and crinoids. This group of animals is entirely marine, meaning they live exclusively within the oceans. There are no freshwater echinoderms, and no terrestrial echinoderms either. Now the final phylum that we'll be talking about as we discuss the diversity of life is phylum chordata. This includes all animals which have a skull and a backbone. We collectively call these animals vertebrates. Vertebrates are represented by mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Now the diversity within the vertebrate group is large, but they make up only 3% of the different types of animals. Even though this makes up only 3% of the diversity of animals, these are definitely the most familiar animals. In fact, I would say 9 out of 10 times if you ask someone to name an animal, they will mention a vertebrate, whether it's a cat or a dog or an elephant or a lion. These are the animals that we would be most likely, say, to go to a zoo and C. Now the first of these, which we'll talk about, are the fish. Now the fish are aquatic, meaning they live the entirety of their lives in water. Now there may be a few species of fish which can survive outside of water for limited periods of time, but as a group they almost entirely live within the water. There are three major categories of fish. There are the jawless fish, the cartilaginous fish, and the bony fish. The next group of animals that we'll talk about are the amphibians. Now amphi means two or double or both, whereas bio in this case is referring to life. So the amphibians, they live two lives, one within water and one outside of water. They're given this name because they can live both on land and in water. Sometimes it will be different stages of the amphibian's life in which they live in, in one domain or the other. So typically the juvenile stage takes place within the water, whereas the adults can leave the water. Even though adult amphibians are able to live outside of water, their reproduction is still directly tied to water. They need to have open bodies of water, such as streams or ponds, in which to lay their eggs and, and for those eggs to develop. So amphibians, they're often able to live both on land and in water. But sometimes at different stages of life. Adults can often live on land, but still require standing water in order to reproduce, because the tadpole stages are entirely aquatic. The next group of animals are reptiles, and they are more adapted to life on land than the amphibians. A few adaptations that reptiles have include waterproof, scaly skin, amniotic eggs. Now the way these adaptations help reptiles live on land is that the waterproof skin prevents them from dehydrating as quickly as an amphibian would. With things like frogs and salamanders and newts, they, their skin must be kept moist, and so if they're away from water for long periods of time, they dry up quite quickly. The waterproof skin of the reptile helps it retain its internal moisture. Similarly, the amniotic eggs allow reproduction to occur away from standing water. 
you can almost think of this amniotic egg as a little private personal pond or pool for that developing reptile embryo. And at the point where it's ready to survive on, on land, it can hatch out of its egg and will then be in its terrestrial environment. Now of the reptiles, most of them are ectotherms. or cold-blooded, meaning they get their body heat from their surrounding, from the environment. The exception to this are birds, which are endotherms. The final group of animals that we'll talk about are the mammals. Like birds, mammals are endotherms, or warm-blooded. Other hallmarks of mammals include milk, which is produced from mammary glands for their young, and also hair. The three groups of mammals are the monotremes, marsupials, and eutherians. These three groups vary from each other based on their pregnancy. The monotremes are egg-laying mammals. This includes the duck-billed platypus and the echidna, or spiny anteater. The marsupials are pouched mammals, meaning that embryonic development happens for a very short period of time within the mother's reproductive system. And then after the young are born, they travel into the mother's pouch and more significant development occurs within the mother's pouch. The last group of mammals are the eutherians or placental mammals. In these cases, the majority of embryonic development takes place within the mother's reproductive system, and by the time the young are born, they have complete body plans and, in essence, look like miniature versions of the adults. With that, that's the end of our discussion of the diversity of life. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video.